am showing 11 o'clock, so we will go ahead and, and get started. So I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us for the Board of Certifications CARE Educational Series. My name is Shannon Fleming, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, I just have a few announcements. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you of AT Regulatory Connect, the secure portal for state regulators. AT Regulatory Connect provides regulators access to certification verifications, the regulatory network, the disciplinary action exchange, and many resources. Also, as you may have heard, the CARE Conference 2021 has been postponed to July 2022. CARE Conference 2022 will be held in Omaha, Nebraska, July 15th through the 16th at the Mar Omaha Marriott Downtown Capital District. In lieu of an in-person conference this year, the BOC is hosting an educational series of articles and webinars. Please be on the lookout for additional information in the coming months. All right, well, today's webinar is titled Professional Certification Coalition Update. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded. Our presenters today are Julia Judish and Craig Saperstein. Julia is Special Counsel with Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman's LLP's Employment and Nonprofit Organizations Practices, with over two decades of experience serving as a trusted advisor on all facets of the unemployment relationship, nonprofit governance, and certification law. Julia regularly advises organizations on legal compliance, workplace issues, resolution of sensitive employee and organizational disputes, certification practices, ethics, and disciplinary codes, ADA accessibility, and related areas. She writes extensively on employment and nonprofit legal issues and is a co-author of the Certification and Accreditation Law Handbook, 3rd Edition, and the Certification, the ICE Handbook, 3rd Edition, which happens to be my, my Bible. Julia is also an advisor to the Professional Certification Coalition and is a member of the Pillsbury COVID-19 Response Task Force. She graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School and has received multiple honors for excellence in legal services. Craig, a partner at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman LLP, assists clients in developing and implementing sophisticated government relations strategies at the federal and state levels. Craig lobbies on behalf of corporate, nonprofit, foreign sovereign, and public sector clients in Congress, the executive branch, and the state and local governments. He represents clients on a variety of policy issues, including financial services, cybersecurity, international trade, veterans, energy, economic development, transportation, and healthcare matters. In particular, Crave manages both federal and multi-state advocacy campaigns on behalf of coalitions, companies, and nonprofit organizations. Craig serves as outside counsel to the Professional Certification Coalition, a nonprofit association of over 100 non-governmental credentialing organizations and of professional associations with certified members spanning many professions. He has significant experience drafting federal and state legislation and amendments in successfully advocating for the enactment of policies supported by our clients. Craig has been nationally ranked by Chambers USA in government and was recognized by the Legal 500 US in government relations. A big welcome to Julia and Craig. Thank you so much, Shannon. We, we really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, to speak uh, to, to everyone at BOC and, and all the regulators uh, who are on the call today. Uh, it's it's cer cer certainly a great honor uh, uh, to, to, to speak to you all. Um, so I, again, I'm, I'm Craig Saperstein. I'm a partner at the Pillsbury Law Firm. 
uh, and I, I serve along with Julia as as primary uh, counsel and you know, day to day managers of the Professional Certification Coalition. Uh, so you know, today we're we're going to take you through a discussion of of uh, what what the, the PCC is, what what we are doing uh, all across the country with respect to legislation and other other sorts of initiatives affecting private professional certification and, and frankly how we're trying to promote private professional certification uh, across the country as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off by just kind of introducing you to, to the PCC and uh, uh, how we how we uh, came into existence and then Julia will, will take you through some of the state level legislation uh, that we're that we're tracking. Um, Shannon, th thanks thanks for, for going ahead and switching to that to that slide. So you know, the PCC really exists to advance the best interests of either of those who either use or rely upon professional certification, such as employers, reimbursers, and, and of course the general public, as well as of the individual professionals themselves who achieve professional certification status. Our members are, are largely non-governmental professional certification organizations like BOC, uh, the professional societies that, that represent certified professionals, as well as uh, service providers, uh, including some of the big uh, testing providers. Um, we advocate for the interests of the certification community across the country before state legislatures. We monitor legislative and regulatory activity affecting the certification community, and we develop research and white papers on the value of private professional certification programs and the effects of legislation that are affecting professional certification and, and occupational licensing more generally. Uh, the, the precursor to the PCC was actually an ad hoc coalition uh, that Pillsbury formed with the Institute for Credentialing Excellence uh, and the American Society of Association Executives in early 2018 to respond to legislation in both Louisiana and Missouri that would have undermined private professional certification. We, we worked with that ad hoc coalition to defeat the potentially harmful bill in Louisiana uh, in particular, and we determined with, with ASAE, which is essentially, as most of you know, the Association for Associations, and with ICE, which is the leading accrediting organization for certification programs, uh, that, the, that the formation of a formal coalition would be prudent to protect the certification community. Um, you know, we, we kind of recognized that the types of bills we were seeing in Louisiana and other states would continue to arise in states all around the country because we discovered that these bills really incorporated language from anti-occupational licensing or anti-certification model legislation that had been drafted or at least endorsed by special interest groups that, that operate all around the country. Um, and in some cases, we discovered through our intelligence gathering that the consequences of many of these occupational licensing bills that we were seeing uh, you know, that had some sort of effect on private professional certification were often actually unintended. Um, and you know, really, really whether the, uh, the potentially harmful consequences of, of legislation were intended or not by the bill sponsors, and, and in many cases the bill sponsors didn't really in, in, intend for, for there to be harmful consequences for certification. Uh, we knew that these bills would keep popping up, and we really wanted to be a voice for the entire certification community as, as these bills were debated. Uh, so, so moving on to, to the next slide. Um, you know, as, as we're making our case to, to lawmakers, policymakers, like, like those of you who, who are on the phone today, as well as other influential stakeholders, a key element of our advocacy is explaining what professional certification is, how it differs from occupational licensing, and, and what its virtues are. Um, I'm sure most, most on the phone know that, you know, in, in this context, professional certification refers to a voluntary process by which a non-governmental entity grants recognition to a person to verify that that person has met established standards of knowledge, skills, or, or competencies in, in, in a particular field. In many cases, you know, certification organizations like BOC rely on a third-party accreditation body standards that demonstrate their ongoing adherence to best practices in a variety of, of areas, including conflicts of interest, test security, exam specifications and development, professional ethics, and, and, of course, test administration. And uh, I'm sure most of you on the phone know that BOC's athletic trainer certification 
is accredited by the National Commission on Certifying Agencies. In, in the course of our advocacy, we, we really, again, try to extol the, the, the benefits or the virtues of professional certification. Some of the, the uh, uh, virtues that we point to are that certifications promote competition by facilitating informed choice for those who would employ or pay for, you know, we're talking about health plans or insurance companies, or use the, the, the professional's uh, services. Um, certifications also allow members of the public to distinguish between those who have obtained some qualifying level of competence uh, or quality for, for those who haven't. Um, and then for the certified individual themselves, uh, the credential really provides kind of a, a modicum of credibility and recognition of job satisfaction and often, often increased earning power or enhanced prospects for employment. And then for, for the many jobs that require specialized skills for which traditional education may not provide adequate preparation, certification programs provide a way for those individuals to identify the skills and knowledge base that they need to master for a specific profession and to demonstrate that, that mastery. Um, you know, another thing that we do in, in the course of our advocacy is we distinguish between professional certification and occupational licensing. But most folks on this call pro probably well understand that distinction, but a lot of state legislators uh, and, and other stakeholders really don't. Um, as you all know, in some fields, including many healthcare professions and, and specifically including athletic training, Many state regulatory agencies have incorporated the competency standards established by non-governmental uh, professional certification programs into licensure requirements. And incorporating those certification standards into the regulatory requirement, of course, acknowledges both, both the importance of setting competency standards for the protection of the public and the value of having those standards defined by you know, the, the true subject matter experts. It, it's, it's really our view, and it appears to be policymakers prevailing view that for these pro professions, the content of the standards is best established by the non-governmental professional certification program, but the enforcement of the standard is more effectively done by the licensing agency. And in professions like athletic training where state licensing boards have historically provided oversight, it really doesn't serve either the interests of the public or of private certification organizations to either eliminate or weaken licensure requirements and shift that enforcement function currently performed by the licensing boards onto private certification programs. And that's really because private certification organizations lack the legal authority and the resources to serve as a substitute for licensing board for professions for which licensing is, is required to protect public health, safety, or welfare. So that's really uh, often the, the crux of, of our advocacy efforts. It's, it's distinguishing between the proper roles of an occupational licensing agency and and, and how private professional certification uh, fit, fits into to, to that you know, uh, uh, dynamic. Um, next slide, please. So we are uh, quite busy this year and, and in past, and indeed the, the, the past several years uh, in terms of providing monitoring and analysis of, of legislation for our members and, and of course advocacy, you know, direct advocacy where, where we think it's necessary. Uh, as this map lays out, and it's probably a few days old, so, so it, it may, may even be colored in a little more, we are tracking over 100 bills in 37 states right now uh, uh, that would have some impact on private professional certification. Um, Julie is going to take you through the categories of bills that we're monitoring, as well as uh, uh, some of the specific bills that, that, that are of uh, greatest concern to us. Uh, but as you can see, there are lots of states uh, uh, considering legislation that would affect private professional certification, and we are aiming to be completely on, uh, on, on top of that. Interestingly, uh, two of the states that aren't colored in, Michigan and Ohio, were, were two states that we were most active in uh, last year. So we expect, if not this full map, uh, to, to be filled in by, by the end of this legislative session, and certainly uh, the vast majority of states, I think, will be filled in uh, because a lot of states are, are tackling these issues. And in fact, the pandemic has has brought a, a new attention to these issues and new types of bills that, that we think are, are of interest uh, to our members and, and to the general public that, that looks to the, the private professional certification community. Um, 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julia, and she's going to give you a rundown of, uh, the, the, again, the, the types of bills we're seeing and, and some of our specific advocacy efforts. Julia? Great. Thanks, Craig. Um, and Shannon, if you could advance the, the next slide. Um, the, the bills we're monitoring fall mostly in one of six buckets. And I'll address uh, later in the presentation um, four of those buckets in more detail. The occupational licensing reform bills that generally call for review and repeal of existing occupational licensure laws and establish presumptions against keeping existing laws or enacting new ones. Um, some of these bills also call for establishing governmental certification programs as an alternative to licensure. I'll be discussing in more detail the many bills we're seeing that aim to remove barriers to licensure for ex-offenders, as well as the many bills seeking to establish either reciprocal licensure or alternative pathways to licensure for individuals who are relocating into a state. But there are two other categories of bills that we've uh, listed on this slide that we encounter less frequently, thankfully, um, but that have um, attracted a, a lot of attention from the PCC and the, the, our membership as um, bills that, that we oppose. Uh, these are Consumer Choice Bills and Right to Earn a Living Act. Uh, the Consumer Choice Bills would create giant loopholes to licensing requirements. Essentially, they would allow unlicensed persons to practice an occupation that ordinarily requires a license. With, under the provisions of some bills, the requirement only that they post a sign disclosing that they're unlicensed. And, and literally, it's you must have on your premises a sign with text that is at least an inch high um, saying that you're not licensed um, with no safeguards for ensuring that the consumers actually see the sign, that they consent to it, that they're seeking services in which the consumer who is um, supposedly offering consent to use an unlicensed individual is the end user of those services um, that they're essentially end runs around licensure laws, um, and thus far, none of them have uh, passed, but we, we view them as very high priority bills when they do pop up. Um, then in the right to earn a living bill, these entitle any individual who feels burdened by a licensure regulation, which essentially yeah, given that it takes effort to apply for a license, would be anyone, um, to sue the state. And they place the burden of proof on the agency to prove that there's no less restrictive alternative to licensure. So ordinarily, uh, a plaintiff who sues bears the burden of proof. Here, the burden of proof would be shifted. Um, and the less restrictive alternative to licensure um, in these bills is determined according to a hierarchy of least restrictive to most restrictive measures. This is a hierarchy we see also in the review and repeal bill. Um, and it's something that is um, the creation of some of these advocacy groups like the Institute for Justice. Um, and it's not anything that state agencies, when they create a regulation, would consult with, and so there won't be any data whatsoever about whether having a bonding program or a certification requirement as opposed to licensure is more or less effective. Um, often these bills also have fee shifting provisions, so if the plaintiff prevails, essentially the state would be financing these lawsuits. Um, we're grateful that none of these bills have yet been enacted, but again, those Two categories are, um, you know, set off our, our red flags, and uh, we've mobilized our membership uh, to voice their opposition to them. I move on now um, to addressing key elements of some of the more common bills. So, uh, we'll go back to the next slide. So, occupational licensing reform efforts is a very broad um, umbrella uh, term. Some of those these efforts have been unobjectionable, at least in the PCC's view. 
um, calling only for commissions to study possible improvements to occupational licensing in, in a balanced way and to make a report uh, essentially providing more information to legislators and regulators in considering how best to engage in occupational regulation. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there's a bill in Minnesota this term that calls for abolishing all licensure laws, period. It's one of the shortest bills that we've been monitoring. Um, that's everything across the board. Um, and there are other bills that we've seen, such as in Mississippi, that call for reducing any occupational licensing regulation by 30%, or for every new regulation, there must be two that are abolished. Um, these sorts of views of any occupational licensing regulation as bad without considering the, the content or the effect on the public at all. all. That's one end of the spectrum. Um, let's fall in the middle, though, and have some recurring characteristics um, that we've seen over time that have led the PCC to seek amendments to those bills rather than as with the consumer choice bill, just outright opposing it. So one common issue, and um, this is the, the issue that really was the impetus to the formation of the PCC, as, as Craig mentioned, is how these bills define the term certified and registered. They're sometimes defined as titles that only the government can issue. So the bill will say the government will provide certification and anyone who's granted certification by the government can use the term certified, but no one else can use that title um, or, or registered, which is a term that some certification organizations use as a, as a synonym for being certified. Um, and barring people from using those titles without state authorization um, is both unconstitutional, but also would preclude those individuals from marketing themselves as having earned their credentials. Um, so that's, that's a big area that, as it's arisen, we've tried to amend the bill. Fortunately, now that we've been in operation for it's now our third year, we see those kinds of provisions less frequently um, as we've educated legislators uh, uh, about the terminology that is important to use. Um, characterizing a certification as the recognition that's issued only by the government um, also tends to have sometimes unintended <laughs> um, effects in that this hierarchy of levels of restrictiveness calls for certification to be used as a less restrictive alternative to a licensure requirement and says that the government should enact certification um, as an alternative to licensure. Um, the vast majority of certification programs, however, are developed by usually nonprofit, but certainly private sector organizations. Um, and so this would position the government to be a competitor uh, to private certification programs and would frankly be a, a waste of, of governmental money uh, because it's not really the area of expertise of the government to stand up a credible psychometrically valid certification program. Um, so we have been seeking to amend those bills to call for government certification only if there's no suitable private certification program that's available in that field. Okay. Uh, next slide. So um, as I mentioned earlier, these bills are often paired with ex-offender re-entry bills, and I'll, I'll go into our principles regarding that in, in more detail later on. Our main concern there is having a balanced approach to protecting the public and also ensuring the bills don't intrude on the right of private organizations to enforce their eligibility and conduct codes. There's a bill we're monitoring and have advocated regarding in Connecticut right now that would um, not only affect what licensing agencies can 
um, consider in terms of an applicant's uh, criminal conviction record, but would also bar uh, private professional societies um, from considering an applicant's criminal conviction record in the same way that they're barred from denying membership to someone based on race or gender having a, a criminal record would under the bill as it's currently drafted uh, would be a protected class. And I'll also uh, go into more detail uh, later in this presentation about the licensing excuse me, licensing reciprocity bills with the um, our concern there is ensuring that the state maintains its substantive licensure standards um, and doesn't take a, a sort of cookie cutter approach mistakenly to assuming that every state's licensure laws are equivalent. And next slide. So, um, as Craig said, the PCC represents the private certification community. So we're on the lookout for certain kinds of provisions when we're doing the, the monitoring. Um, just because a bill may mention occupational licensure doesn't mean that it, it becomes one of our priorities. We're really looking for how it interacts with or affects either directly or indirectly the private certification community. We're very interested in um, ensuring that the language in these bills does not restrict or intrude on the role of voluntary private certification programs in helping to credential and qualify uh, professionals in any field, um, and that private certification organizations can define and enforce their own standards, eligibility standards, and their ethics codes or codes of conduct, because private certification is their product, it's their endorsement. And so the state should not be dictating to a private certification organization, um, this is how you need to define who you say has your endorsement, who can use your credential. The PCC represents, um, in terms of its membership, certification organizations that issue credentials that are wholly voluntary. They're issued in, um, professions that don't require licensure for the individual to practice them. One of our founders, for example, the American Society of Association Executives, ASAE, issues a credential, the Certified Association Executive, the CAE credential that is respected and sought after by association management executives, um, but there is no state that requires an executive of a association to have that credential. But we also do include a fair number of members that issue credentials that are incorporated into requirements for licensure in regulated professions, healthcare, finance, engineering, and athletic trainers. <laughs> um, our view is that state legislators and regulators, because sometimes this is determined a statute and sometimes um, it is left to the agency to determine what those requirements should be, should conduct careful review before repealing any current requirements for professional certification in licensure statutes and regulations. We're kind of a Switzerland <laughs> uh, um, on the issue of whether there should be more regulation of occupations or less. As I mentioned we have members in the wholly voluntary um, professions and members in regulated professions. So we're not pushing um, the state agencies and, and lawmakers in one direction for more regulation or less, but we are saying before you alter the status quo, if there's been a judgment um, by a legislature, by an agency that up until now a particular uh, occupation should be regulated, then don't just across the board dial that back. 
take a careful look and make sure that the standards for determining whether to keep that occupational regulation are balanced. Um, so a, a number of the, the bills that we've seen, um, the uh, review and repeal bills or sunset review or sunrise review bills create evidentiary uh, protect, uh, presumptions that place a high burden of proof higher than the, the ordinary standards um, for justifying whether an occupational regulation um, should be uh, continued or adopted. Um, and we often it, the language we see is that it has to be supported by um, present substantiated uh, evidence of harms to the public, to public safety and public health, we see in almost all bills, um, and some bills also public welfare. Uh, but we've been advocating to remind legislators that licensure laws appropriately set a higher bar than merely protecting the public from gross negligence and injury, um, and that often the evidence of the harm um, is not necessarily there, rather it's evidence of the benefit to the public of having licensure uh, regulations that set the bar at higher level than just you're not going to be maimed or killed by the professional. Next slide. As Craig mentioned, we're also cognizant of and seeking to educate legislators about the different but complementary roles of private certification and state licensing agencies, um, particularly in regulated professions um, like healthcare and finance, um, and making sure that these laws do not uh, do not change that balance in terms of having the subject matter experts in the field and the private organizations determine what the standards of competence and skills should be, um, but at the same time not abolishing state oversight and enforcement um, and saying that the certification organization should carry that water. Um, the issue here is particularly important with respect to enforcement of conduct expectations. Certification organizations do have codes of conduct, but they're often piggybacking on the actions of state agencies and state enforcement actions because certification organizations don't have the resources and don't have the legal authority to act as fact finders in the first instance. Um, the most they can do is say, we're taking away your title, you can't use our certification and, anymore, but they can't stop someone from practicing. They can't subpoena witnesses for their internal administrative disciplinary proceedings. Um, they can't issue suspensions of the right to practice. And, Really, it is the state agencies who are on the front line who are able to, in certain search circumstances, act very quickly to protect the public, who are able to gather evidence and provide hearings that have full due process. Um, you know, that's your role, and we value it. Uh, we, the professional certification community, and we, the public, value it. Um, and so simply turning to credentialing organizations and saying that they're able to protect the public um, in, in occupations in which there's been regulation is, is not an adequate substitute. Um, so that's the position that we've been explaining to legislators and some of our advocacy efforts. Next slide. Moving on to the ex-offender re-entry legislation, these have actually been the plurality of bills that we've been monitoring for the most part until this year. We also started monitoring the um, licensure reciprocity bills, and there are a lot of those too. Um, the ex-offender re-entry bills are 
sometimes written so broadly that they could open the door to lawsuits against private organizations. We, uh, Pillsbury has actually had a client who's been sued based on some of these laws that are directed at, at licensing agencies, um, ultimately prevailed in, in um, having the court determine that the law did not apply to private certification organizations. Um, but our fundamental position is that private certification organizations have a right to self-regulate and that they, they should self-regulate and be careful in terms of having codes of conduct that are tied to their legitimate concerns, that it, it's not an area in which um, the legislature should be regulating them uh, because of uh, the constitutional rights in the First Amendment to freedom of speech, freedom of association, that affects uh, certification organizations and professional societies and allows them to determine sort of who they let in, who they endorse, um, as long as there's not a compelling state interest, such as in avoiding you know, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, um, that those standards are violating. So um, as, as part of that, uh, we want to ensure <clears throat> that private certification organizations, that they're able to bestow their credentials on who they want to in terms of saying, this is what our credential means, and someone who holds that meets all of those requirements, the substantive competency, knowledge requirements, and conduct requirements. And there's a, a really wide range in terms of private certification organizations about what kinds of requirements there are. Um, some certifications are highly technical and really don't care about the private conduct of individuals, at least if they are, as that conduct may be unrelated to the specific performance of, of the task. And, and the answer there is this person has met our technical standards and that's all of our, our certification signifies to the public. Other organizations um, feel that their uh, the nature of the profession is such and the nature of the credential is such that it, is broad enough to encompass whether the individual acts in a way that is viewed as ethical and moral, um, even if it falls outside of their professional role. Um, but that's something, again, that we think should be left to the certification organization to define. We also think that it is appropriate for in some circumstances, the certification organizations to decide that there are some kinds of criminal convictions that would perpetually disqualify an individual from holding their private certification. What we're seeing in these ex-offender reentry bills, a, a common theme is that licensure agencies cannot disqualify an applicant from a license unless the license is directly related uh, to the scope of practice or unless it's a felony or um, if a certain number of years have elapsed either from the conviction or from the sentence. Um, and that's something that we address in our advocacy in terms of what we think is best practice for, for licensure laws. But with respect to how private certification organizations issue their credential, um, you know, if, if someone wants to if a certification organization wants to say that we are, are not giving someone our endorsement as a medical professional if they have ever had a conviction for child sexual abuse, then you know the number of passage of uh, the number of years that have passed shouldn't, shouldn't matter for that. Next slide. So. Um, the conduct requirements for conforming with private certification organization standards often overlap with the legal requirements that carry criminal penalties. So the way that these bills are drafted, some of them say that 
a licensing agency can't take action um, that is solely or in part tied to a criminal conviction of an applicant. So we want to make sure that if there's a certification organization that has a code of conduct that says you're not eligible either to, to get our credential or well, revoke your credential if you have a conviction for, say, embezzlement or fraud, um, that and that therefore the individual doesn't have a certification that is a condition for licensure, that the ex offender reentry bill still allows the licensing agency to deny a license to the individual for the reason that they lack the certification that's required for licensure, even though it is a criminal conviction that gave rise to the loss of that certification. Um, we've already talked about the, the different levels of, of resources that have about investigations and the advantage that uh, state licensing agencies have in terms of providing due process hearings. Um, and we also have public policy concerns about how some of these bills are drafted. Um, in particular, the restrictions on licensing agencies considering any criminal conviction unless it is a felony um, is unwarranted in our view. Over 90% of criminal convictions are the result of guilty pleas. Um, a very small percentage of um, criminal prosecutions actually go to trial. And it is extremely common for the plea bargain to include a reduction in the level of the offense with which the um, defendant was originally charged. And that may include dropping down from a felony to a misdemeanor. But the underlying conduct is the same. In addition, there's not a single uniform um, standard for what a, a felony is. Um, in some states, a felony is any crime for which um, an individual can be sentenced for six months or more in jail. In others, it's a year or more. You're not comparing apples to apples. So again, we, we go back to the principle that we think that um, licensing agencies should be looking at the underlying conduct. Next slide. Um, and then, uh, again, that uh, we, we do recognize that um, the standards are have been enacted as the legislature's judgment or the agency's judgment about what is necessary to protect the public. We also recognize the criminal record should not disqualify ex-offenders due to stigma alone. Um, there's a difference between putting blinders on licensing agencies to establish facts about an applicant's history. Let's look at what the applicant did and how that relates to the license of issue and deeming any criminal conviction a sign of disqualifying moral failing. So this is a scarlet letter. You have a criminal record, therefore you're not um, eligible for the license regardless of the nature of the crime. Next slide. So um, in terms of licensing reciprocity legislation, we just started this year really carefully monitoring um, these bills. And they've really taken off this year, um, in part, I think, because of uh, the pandemic. Um, but it's been an initiative. Um, the, the impetus of these bills initially focused on members of the military and their family members who may have to move uh, frequently because of where they're deployed and making it easier for them uh, to have access um, to uh, practice their profession in the place where they've moved. But they've also expanded to general initiatives about licensing reciprocity for anyone who is, is mobile. Um, and in addition, because 
and for many professions, not all states require licensure. Um, some of these bills include alternative pathways to licensure based on work experience or credentials for individuals who are unlicensed because their state doesn't require a license to that profession, but are moving to a state that does require licensure. So we've developed um, six principles about these bills um, that I'll, I'll go over quickly here, but I'm happy to address more in depth. We want, we want to leave time for questions. One is that there shouldn't be a cookie cutter approach taken um, to this licensure reciprocity. It really should be that these bills should charge each licensure agency with developing what the rules should be for reciprocity um, and specific to that profession rather than an across the board approach. Um, and that as step one, those licensing agencies should look at whether licensing of licenses in other jurisdictions address the same scope of practice and have the same standards. If they do have the same scope of practice and the same qualifications, then streamlining the application process makes sense. Um, but pharmacy technicians, for example, in some states are allowed to give immunizations and in other states aren't and their training qualifications are accordingly different in those different states. And, and so you don't want to treat different kinds of authorization as, as equivalent if that means an individual hasn't had necessary training. Um, so again, the principle of consistency, substantial similarity between required, requirements, knowledge, and scope of practice for the two jurisdictions. Next slide. If reciprocity is granted, we also think it's important that there be joint oversight of the licensee and communication between the state agencies and the two jurisdictions so that each is aware of whether there's a pending disciplinary or enforcement action against the individual and that reciprocity is used as a way to escape discipline in one jurisdiction and just for bad apples to move around. With respect to fields in which there isn't licensure requirements in every jurisdiction, um, granting alternative pathways should happen only if the applicant uh, demonstrates at least substantially equivalent qualifications, rather than just saying, oh, the applicant has worked for a while, won't grant it to them. Yeah, work experience is not a substitute for qualifications. You know, this could be someone who is constantly fired for malpractice. Um, and agencies should consider whether to only grant reciprocal licensure to folks moving into their state. I'll stop there and, and turn it back over to, to Craig. Thank you, Julia. And if uh, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, actually, uh, one more slide, please. So I'm going to very quickly, recognizing how little time we have, uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly about some federal initiatives that the PCC is pursuing. The first one uh, relates to a bill that we actually drafted uh, with, with members of Congress uh, last year and that we, we expect to be reintroduced uh, perhaps, probably as soon as a matter of days from now. Uh, that bill, uh, it's called to the Freedom to Invest in Tomorrow's Workforce Act, would actually allow for funds in a 529 college savings plan types of plans that, that individuals use uh, uh, to, to, to help their, their family members save for college uh, to be used for specialized training and certification or licensure fees. Um, we think that this is a, a really uh, good way to promote both uh, skills training as well as obtaining and maintaining uh, professional credentials uh, for, for people for whom you know, the traditional four-year college route uh, it, uh, it is, is not the chosen route. And, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of 529 plans that, they're, that they are, uh, you know, a, a savings vehicle for, for the affluent. And our belief is that, you know, this, this could encourage a much broader group of individuals to save for whatever form of post-secondary education might end up being, being the most appropriate burden 
for their children or grandchildren or whoever the, the beneficiary of the, the 529 plan uh, funds uh, uh, are, are going to. Um, so th- this, this is kind of an effort, you know, Julia, Julia identified a bunch of defense that we're playing uh, to protect private professional certification all around the country. This is, we kind of consider this offense, you know, kind of a way to promote uh, professional certification uh, uh, at the federal level. And, and by the way, I would note that these, that the, the legislation that we've been working on uh, would, would, all, would allow expenses associated with testing in particular to be covered uh, 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 as an allowable expense uh, for which uh, a person could use a 529 plan for. Uh, so we're excited about that legislation. Again, it was introduced last year. It's going to be reintroduced this year, and, and we look forward to building some momentum for, for that bill. Another bill that we're working on uh, is a bill that, that we, we didn't create, but, but that we're, we're hoping to, to promote and, and have some influence over, and that's a bill called the Skills Renewal Act. It's a bipartisan bill that's been introduced in both the House and the Senate, and it would, pr- would provide a $4,000 tax credit for workers who have been displaced by the pandemic, either either uh, uh, who have lost their job or have been furloughed from their job. Those workers would be able to use that tax credit for training, education, and certification purposes, essentially the, the costs associated with, with any of those activities. Um, we're, we're excited about this bill. We, we had hoped to have seen it. Uh, included in one of the COVID relief packages that Congress has passed, you know, they passed one uh, right before the holidays, and then uh, the, the House is actually going to pass President Biden's American Rescue Plan today, and the President will sign it into law later this week. We had hoped, we'd hoped this bill would be incorporated into one of those bills. It unfortunately was not, but I actually just spoke to, to uh, staff for Senator Amy, Amy Klobuchar yesterday. Uh, she's the, the Senate side uh, author of this bill, and and they have every intention of continuing to pursue this legislation. Um, we're actually working with them on, on some ways to perhaps improve the legislation to ensure that uh, all forms of, of certification would be eligible uh, for, for this tax credit. And um, uh, we, we continue those conversations with her and with, with other uh, uh, decision makers on Capitol Hill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then the last thing I, I was just going to point to is – we're doing a, a lot of work outside of the legislatures by coordinating with other interested groups, whether it be allies of ours, whether it be nonpartisan groups such as think tanks, as well as ideological groups, um, and making sure that they understand the PCC's message. A lot of these bills that Julia went through uh, at the state level uh, are, are the source of, are, have their source as model legislation drafted by advocacy groups. Again, it could be a a think tank, or it could be an actual, you know, special interest group. And so um, we have really made an effort to talk to those groups to see where we can find common ground with them. And we've actually noticed improvements in model legislation, improvements from a professional certification perspective, at least, uh, in some of the model legislation that some of these groups have put forward since we've been talking to them. We also have given a number of presentations to uh, legislators, uh, as well as re- regulators, like like those of you on, on the call today, and we continue to will continue to do that. Um, we we also put out some white papers and some statements of principle, uh, which you can uh, view at, at at our website, profcertcoalition.org. Uh, we, we've done it on on these criminal conviction issues, on licensing reciprocity issues, as well as on occupational licensing reform issues uh, generally. Um, so we we hope you'll you'll access those. And, take a deeper dive into some of the items that we've hit on today. Uh, Julie, I think you were going to discuss the, the last item yeah. on this slide. And, and very briefly, we, we've also um, then submitted one amicus brief along with um, the Institute for Credential and Excellence and um, the American Society of Association Executives um, in a Court of Appeals case. Um, there have been a whole range uh, of lawsuits out there filed by um, usually medical specialists against medical specialty certification boards, challenging maintenance of certification and recertification requirements on the theory that initial certification and recertification are two separate products that are being tied together against the desire of the certificants in a way that would violate antitrust laws. 
those have been rejected by multiple district courts at this point. Um, uh, and we filed an amicus brief um, supporting that outcome, um, and especially on the principle that private certification organizations have the right to define their eligibility standards and to change them over time and to impose recertification requirements. Um, the, just last month, the Court of Appeals affirmed the district court decision, um, and so we're very pleased by that. And we'll stop now and take questions. Okay, I do have one question it looks like. Uh, it says, thank you for your updates today. Are there certain reciprocity models, such as interstate co licensure compacts that the coalition views as better than others? Yes. <laughs> so um, most of these reciprocity bills are actually drafted carefully to say that they're applying only to um, licensure decisions that are made where there's not an interstate licensure compact. They're not, they're not trying to um, supplant interstate licensure compacts, um, but really we think that's the, the best model is that compact model because almost by definition in those professions in those states, that means that the agencies have gone through the exercise of looking to see, does it make sense for our states to have reciprocity with each other? Is there that level of equivalence? Um, and it could actually lead to there being more commonly shared requirements um, for the purposes of getting to yes on an interstate uh, compact. Um, and we, we certainly don't have any objection to there being you know, uniform laws or standards um, across states. It's where there are differences that we are concerned with the reciprocity laws. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I know I had one other question uh, in the chat box about whether or not um, you had a list of the bills that you are currently monitoring on, on available um, on your website. So we do, but it's in our four members section of, of our website. So we, we uh, routinely update, uh, particularly in the first few months of the year when state legislative sessions, uh, state legislators are actively in session, um, we may do analysis and monitoring of bills and make them available to PCC members. But we have not made those watch lists available to non-members. So, I guess one question for the BFC is whether you just want to make a, a list. Um, but we're, we're also certainly happy to have you contact us if there are specific questions about bills in your state um, that you have. And we, we welcome um, learning from you and, and you learning from us. Yeah, I would, I, I would just add to that. Um, I, I saw the the previous question was Missy Anthony uh, in Ohio, I, I believe it. Assuming it's the same Missy Anthony, um, who, who we, we had a great dialogue with um, uh, on, a, on a bill in Ohio last year. So, so we, we would welcome the opportunity to, to learn from you, uh, those of you who are regulators on this call in particular, uh, about what you're tracking. And in turn, we would, of course, be happy to, to, to share our, our insights. I mean, you know, as Julia mentioned, we do produce this very comprehensive watch list for our members, which which includes a lot of detailed analysis and, and frankly, outlines the PCC strategy for dealing with this bill. So obviously, that, that, that's kind of a, a member benefit that we want to be protective of. But at the same time, you know, we, we could we're, we're always happy to talk to, to regulators in particular about their their uh, interests uh, and and, and uh, how we can potentially work together or or, or at least share information. Uh, with, with one another. Great. One more uh, question. Just it said. So, should we contact the BOC regarding what bills are being watched, or will they notify state associations when they are watching something within their state? And and Danny, uh, just to answer your questions, 
Um, so, you know, if uh, there is interest, I can collect, uh, make a list of bills that we are um, currently watching in, in this realm and uh, put that on the regulatory network um, uh, for to share. Uh, so, um, and then Tim indicated that uh, New Jersey, I believe, is the only state that has specific telemedicine regulations for athletic trainers. Do you know of any others? So, uh, I, I don't, and one thing the PCC does not do is get involved or monitor um, legislation that relates to specific professions, um, because we have so many, such a range of members in different professions, and that's that's really what those organizations do in house. Um, and uh, our role is monitoring bills that affect certification organizations across professions. Um, so, so uh, the BFC may be aware of any, but, but the PCC is not. Yeah, and and I'll just jump in there, Tim, I am not aware of any regulations. I know that there are athletic trainers mentioned in obviously some telemedicine or telehealth laws, uh, but as far as uh, specific rules and regs uh, to athletic trainers, I, I'm not at this time, but I, I do encourage anyone um, that if you have a topic that you would like to discuss in a network type uh, environment, to get onto the regulatory network and post a question and and um, have have your colleagues answer those questions. Um, so, and I just got a, a comment from Stuart in Texas saying that telehealth bill is going through the process this legislative session. So, um, so there are definitely other states out there, but please use that regulatory network um, to help each other out. So. Uh, so we are at our, a lot of time actually over a little bit, uh, but I want to thank again to Julia and Craig for their time today. Um, we would also like to thank the BOC's Regulatory Affairs Advisory Panel for their guidance. And finally, thank you. Uh, we greatly appreciate your participation today. We look for, uh, please look for additional information on the next CARE Educational Series opportunity. Uh, thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.